brought to you by bunnyslippers.com. Check out their brand new Dino Sound Slippers. Slippers make a roaring sound every three steps. Made with green scaly fabric, soft plush uppers, foam footbeds, non-slip grips on soles, and three white claws on each foot. One size fits most up to women's ten and a half, men's nine. Footbed measures ten and a half. Black Clock Audio Tales is a daily podcast that reads you a story, either a chapter of a novel or a whole short story. Join us in our exploration of old ghost stories, supernatural fiction, horror tales, folk tales, fantasy, gothic horror, weird fiction, and cosmic horror. And don't forget to join us for our monthly show about the Cthulhu Mythos. Look for our podcast near the old wishing well in the Blasted Heath, wherever you find your podcast. We suggest Podbean or Apple Podcasts. Find us on the web at pgttcm.com and at Black Clock Audio on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and Black Clock Audio Tales on YouTube. Welcome to Black Clock Audio Tales. Check out our new website over at www.pgttcm.com. Edited by Daniel Spitzer. Music by Kevin McLeod. The Chamber, A Price of Gloom, Despair. Welcome to Part 1, Folklore of Great Britain. Join us at the end of the month when we talk about the Great Old Ones. The Brownie of Fern Den There have been many brownies known in Scotland, and stories have been written about the Brownie of Bodsbeck and the Brownie of Blednock, but about neither of them has a prettier story been told than that which I am going to tell you about the Brownie of Fern Den. Now Fern Den was a farmhouse, which got its name from the glen, or den, on the edge of which it stood and through which any one who wished to reach the dwelling had to pass. And this glen was believed to be the abode of a brownie, who never appeared to any one in the daytime, but who, it was said, was sometimes seen at night stealing about, like an ungainly shadow from tree to tree, trying to keep from observation, and never by any chance harming anybody. Indeed, like all brownies that are properly treated, and let alone, so far was he from harming anybody that he was always on the lookout to do a good turn to those who needed his assistance. The farmer often said that he did not know what he would do without him, for if there was any work to be finished in a hurry at the farm, corn to thrash or winnow or tie up into bags, turnips to cut, clothes to wash, a kern to be kerned, a garden to be weeded, all that the farmer and his wife had to do, was to leave the door of the barn or the turnip shed or the milk house open when they went to bed and put down a bowl of new milk on the doorstep for the brownie's supper and when they woke the next morning the bowl would be empty and the job finished better than if it had been done by mortal hands in spite of all this however which might have proved to them how gentle and kindly the creature really was every one about the place was afraid of him and would rather go a couple of miles round about in the dark when they were coming home from kirk or market than pass through the glen and run the risk of catching a glimpse of him i said that they were all afraid of him but that was not true for the farmer's wife was so good and gentle that she was not afraid of anything on god's earth and when the brownie supper had to be left outside she always filled his bowl with the richest milk and added a good spoonful of cream to it. For, said she, he works so hard for us and asks no wages, he well deserves the very best meal that we can give him. One night this gentle lady was taken very ill, and everyone was afraid that she was going to die. Of course her husband was greatly distressed, and so were her servants, for she had been such a good mistress to them that they loved her as if she had been their mother. But they were all young, and none of them knew very much about illness, and every one agreed that it would be better to send off for an old woman who lived about seven miles away on the other side of the river, who was known to be a very skillful nurse. But who was to go? That was the question, for it was black midnight, and the way to the old woman's house lay straight through the glen, and whoever travelled that road ran the risk of meeting the dreaded brownie. The farmer would have gone only too willingly, but he dare not leave his wife alone, 
and the servants stood in groups about the kitchen, each one telling the other that he ought to go, yet no one offering to go themselves. Little did they think that the cause of all their terror, a queer, wee, misshapen little man all covered with hair, with a long beard, red-rimmed eyes, broad, flat feet, just like the feet of a paddock, and enormous long arms that touched the floor, even when he stood upright, was within a yard or two of them listening to their talk, with an anxious face behind the kitchen door. For he had come up as usual from his hiding place in the glen, to see if there were any work for him to do, and to look for his bowl of milk. And he had seen from the open door and lit-up windows that there was something wrong inside the farmhouse, which at that hour was wont to be dark and still and silent, and he had crept into the entry to try and find out what the matter was. When he gathered from the servants' talk that the mistress whom he loved so dearly and who had been so kind to him was ill, his heart sank within him, and when he heard that the silly servants were so taken up with their own fears that they dared not set out to fetch a nurse for her, his contempt and anger knew no bounds. "'Fools! Idiots! Dolts!' he murdered to himself, stamping his queer, misshapen feet on the floor. "'They speak as if a body were ready to take a bite off of them, as soon as ever he met them. If they only knew the bother it gives me to keep out of their road, they wouldn't a be so silly. But by my troth, if they go on like this, the bonny lady will die amongst their fingers. So it strikes me that Brownie must e'en gang himself.' So saying, he reached up his hand, and took down a dark cloak which belonged to the farmer, which was hanging on a peg on the wall, and throwing it over his head and shoulders, or as somewhat to hide his ungainly form, he hurried away to the stable, and saddled and bridled the fleetest-footed horse that stood there. When the last buckle was fastened, he led it to the door and scrambled on its back. "'Now, if ever thou travel fleetly, travel fleetly now,' he said." and it was as if the creature understood him, for it gave a little whinny, and pricked up its ears, and it darted out into the darkness like an arrow from the bow. In less time than the distance had ever been ridden in before, the brownie drew rein at the old woman's cottage. She was in bed fast asleep, but he rapped sharply on the window, and when she rose and put her old face, framed in its white mutch, close to the pane to ask who was there, he bent forward and told her his errand. "'Thou must come with me, good wife, and that quickly,' he commanded, in his deep, harsh voice, "'if the lady of Ferndan's life is to be saved, for there is no one to nurse her up by at the farm there, save a lot of empty-headed servant wenches.' "'But how am I to get there? Have they sent a cart for me?' asked the old woman anxiously, for as far as she could see, there was nothing at the door save a horse and its rider." "'No, they have sent no cart,' replied the brownie shortly. "'So you must just climb up behind me on the saddle "'and hang on tight to my waist, "'and I'll promise to land ye at Fern Den safe and sound.' "'His voice was so masterful "'that the old woman dare not refuse to do as she was bid. "'Besides, she had often ridden pillion-wise when she was a lassie, "'so she made haste to dress herself, "'and when she was ready she unlocked her door.' and mounting the looping-on stain that stood beside it, she was soon seated behind the dark-cloaked stranger, with her arms clasped tightly round him. Not a word was spoken till they approached the dreaded glen. Then the old woman felt her courage giving way. "'Do you think that there will be any chance of meeting the brownie?' she asked timidly. "'I would fain not to run the risk, for folk say that he is an unchancy creature.' Her companion gave a curious laugh. "'Keep up your heart and dinner talk havers,' he said, "'for I promise ye, you'll see naught uglier this night "'than the man whom ye ride behind.' "'Oh, then, I'm fine and safe,' replied the old woman, "'with a sigh of relief, "'for although I have na seen your face, "'I warrant that ye are a true man "'for the care ye have taken of a poor old woman.' "'She relapsed into silence again, "'till the glen was passed and the good horse "'had turned into the farmyard.' Then the horseman slid to the ground, and turning round he lifted her carefully down in his long, strong arms. As he did so, the cloak slipped off him, 
revealing his short, broad body and his misshapen limbs. "'In all the world, what kind of man are ye?' she asked, peering into his face in the grey morning light, which was just dawning. "'What makes your eyes so big? And what have ye done to your feet? They are more like paddock's webs than aught else.' The queer little man laughed again. "'I've wandered many a mile in my time without a horse to help me, and I've heard it said that o'er much walkin' makes the feet unshapely,' he replied. "'But waste no time in talkin', good dame. Go thy way into the house, and hark ye. If anyone asks thee who brought thee hither so quickly, tell them that there was a lack of men, so thou hadst e'en to be content to ride behind the brownie of Fern Den.'" THE WITCH OF FIFE In the kingdom of Fife, in the days of long ago, there lived an old man and his wife. The old man was a deuce quiet body, but the old woman was lightsome and flighty, and some of the neighbors were wont to look at her askance and whisper to each other that they sorely feared that she was a witch. And her husband was afraid of it, too, for she had a curious habit of disappearing in the gloaming and staying out all night and when she returned in the morning, she looked quite white and tired, as if she had been traveling far, or working hard. He used to try and watch her carefully, in order to find out where she went or what she did, but he never managed to do so, for she always slipped out of the door when he was not looking, and before he could reach it to follow her, she had vanished utterly. At last, one day, when he could stand the uncertainty no longer, he asked her to tell him straight out whether she were a witch or no, and his blood ran cold when, without the slightest hesitation, she answered that she was, and if he would promise not to let anyone know, the next time that she went on one of her midnight expeditions, she would tell him all about it. The good man promised, for it seemed to him just as well that he should know all about his wife's cantrips. He had not long to wait before he heard of them, for the very next week the moon was new, which is, as everybody knows, the time of all others, when witches like to stir abroad, and on the first night of the new moon his wife vanished, nor did she return till daybreak next morning. And when he asked her where she had been, she told him, in great glee, how she and four like-minded companions had met at the old kirk on the moor and had mounted branches of the green bay tree, and stalks of hemlock, which had instantly changed into horses, and how they had ridden swift as the wind over the country, hunting the foxes and the weasels, and the owls, and how at last they had swam the forth, and come to the top of Bell Lomond, and how there they had dismounted from their horses, and drunk beer that had been brewed in no earthly brewery, out of horn cups that had been fashioned by no mortal hands, and how after that a wee wee man had jumped up from under a great mossy stone, with a tiny set of bagpipes under his arm, and how he had piped such wonderful music that at the sound of it the very trouts jumped out of the loch below, and the stoats crept out of their holes, and the corby crows and the herons came, and sat on the trees in the darkness to listen and how all the witches danced until they were so weary that, when the time came for them to mount their steeds again, if they would be home before cock crow, they could scarce sit on them for fatigue. The good man listened to this long story in silence, shaking his head meanwhile, and when it was finished all that he answered was, "'And what the better are ye for all your dancing? Ye'd have been a deal more comfortable at home.' At the next new moon the old wife went off again for the night, and when she returned in the morning she told her husband how, on this occasion, she and her friends had taken cockle shells for boats, and had sailed away over the stormy sea until they reached Norway, and there they had mounted invisible horses of wind, and had ridden and ridden over mountains and glens and glaciers, till they reached the land of the Laps lying under its mantle of snow. And here all the elves and fairies and mermaids of the north were holding festival with warlocks and brownies and pixies, and even the phantom hunters themselves, who were never looked upon by mortal eyes, and the witches from Fife held festival with them, and danced and feasted and sang with them, and, what was of more consequence, 
they learned from them certain wonderful words which, when they uttered them, would bear them through the air, and would undo all bolts and bars, and so gain them admittance to any place soever where they wanted to be. And after that they had come home again, delighted with the knowledge which they had acquired. "'What took ye to sicken a land as that?' asked the old man, with a contemptuous grunt. "'Ye would have been a sight warmer in your bed.' But when his wife returned from her next adventure, he showed a little more interest in her doings, for she told him how she and her friends had met in the cottage of one of their number, and how, having heard that the Lord Bishop of Carlisle had some very rare wine in his cellar, they had placed their feet on the crook from which the pot hung, and had pronounced the magic words which they had learned from the elves of Lapland, and lo and behold they flew up the chimney like whiffs of smoke, and sailed through the air like little wreaths of cloud, and in less time than it takes to tell, they landed at the bishop's palace at Carlisle. And the bolts and the bars flew loose before them, and they went down to his cellar and sampled his wine, and were back in fife, fine, sober old women by cock-crow. When he heard this, the old man started from his chair in right earnest, for he loved good wine above all things, and it was but seldom that it came his way. "'By my troth, but thou art a wife to be proud of,' he cried. "'Tell me the words, woman, and I will e'en go and sample his lordship's wine for myself.' But the good wife shook her head. "'Na, na, I cannot do that,' she said. "'For if I did, and ye telled it over again, "'twould turn the whole world upside down. "'For everybody would believe in their own lawful work "'and flying about the world "'after other folks' business and other folks' dainties. "'So just bide content, good man. "'Ye get on fine with the knowledge ye already possess.' "'And although the old man tried to persuade her "'with all the soft words he could think of, "'she would not tell him her secret.' But he was a sly old man, and the thought of the bishop's wine gave him no rest. So night after night he went and hid in the old woman's cottage, in the hope that his wife and her friends would meet there, and although for a long time it was all in vain, at last his trouble was rewarded. For one evening the whole five old women assembled, and in low tones and with chuckles of laughter they recounted all that had befallen them in Lapland. Then, running to the fireplace, they, one after another, climbed on a chair and put their feet on the sooty crook. Then they repeated the magic words, and hey, presto, they were up the lum and away before the old man could draw his breath. I can do that too, he said to himself, and he crawled out of his hiding place and ran to the fire. He put his foot on the crook and repeated the words, and up the chimney he went, and flew through the air after his wife and her companions, as if he had been a warlock born. And, as witches are not in the habit of looking over their shoulders, they never noticed that he was following them until they reached the bishop's palace, and went down into his cellar. Then, when they found that he was among them, they were not too well pleased. However, there was no help for it, and they settled down to enjoy themselves. They tapped this cask of wine, and they tapped that, drinking a little of each, but not too much, for they were cautious old women, and they knew that if they wanted to get home before cock crow, it behoved them to keep their heads clear. But the old man was not so wise, for he sipped and he sipped, until at last he became quite drowsy, and lay down on the floor and fell fast asleep. And his wife, seeing this, thought that she would teach him a lesson not to be so curious in the future. So, when she and her four friends thought that it was time to be gone, she departed without waking him. He slept peacefully for some hours, until two of the bishop's servants coming down to the cellar to draw wine for their master's table almost fell over him in the darkness. Greatly astonished at his presence there, for the cellar door was fast locked, they dragged him up to the light and shook him, and cuffed him, and asked him how he came to be there. And the poor old man was so confused at being awakened in this rough way, and his head seemed to whirl round so fast, that all he could stammer out was that he came from Fife and that he had travelled on the midnight wind. As soon as they heard that, 
the men servants cried out that he was a warlock and they dragged him before the bishop and as bishops in those days had a holy horror of warlocks and witches he ordered him to be burned alive when the sentence was pronounced you may be very sure that the poor old man wished with all his heart that he had stayed quietly at home in bed and had never hankered after the bishop's wine but it was too late to wish that now for the servants dragged him out into the courtyard and put a chain round his waist and fastened it to a great iron stake and they piled faggots of wood round his feet and set them alight as the first tiny little tongue of flame crept up the poor old man thought that his last hour had come but when he thought that he forgot completely that his wife was a witch for just as the little tongue of flame began to singe his breeches there was a swish and a flutter in the air and a great gray bird with outstretched wings appeared in the sky and swooped down suddenly and perched for a moment on the old man's shoulder and in this gray bird's mouth was a little red perny which to everyone's amazement it popped on to the prisoner's head then it gave one fierce croak and flew away again but to the old man's ears that croak was the sweetest music that he had ever heard for to him it was the croak of no earthly bird but the voice of his wife whispering words of magic to him and when he had heard them he jumped for joy for he knew that they were words of deliverance and he shouted them aloud and his chains fell off and he mounted in the air up and up while the onlookers watched him in awestruck silence he flew right away to the kingdom of fife without as much as saying good-bye to them and when he found himself once more safely at home you may be very sure that he never tried to find out Asipaddle and the Mester Stirworm In far bygone days in the north there lived a well-to-do farmer who had seven sons and one daughter, and the youngest of these seven sons bore a very curious name, for men called him Asipaddle, which means he who grovels among the ashes. Perhaps Asipaddle deserved his name, for he was rather a lazy boy who never did any work on the farm as his brothers did, but ran about the doors with ragged clothes and unkempt hair, and whose mind was ever filled with wondrous stories of trolls and giants, elves and goblins. When the sun was hot in the long summer afternoons, when the bees droned drowsily and even the tiny insects seemed almost asleep, the boy was content to throw himself down on the ash heap amongst the ashes and lie there, lazily letting them run through his fingers, as one might play with sand on the seashore, basking in the sunshine and telling stories to himself. And his brothers, working hard in the fields, would point to him with mocking fingers and laugh, and say to each other how well the name suited him, and of how little use he was in the world. And when they came home from their work, they would push him about and tease him, and even his mother would make him sweep the floor, and draw water from the well, and fetch peats from the peat stack, and do all the little odd jobs that nobody else would do. So poor Asipaddle had rather a hard life of it, and he would often have been very miserable, had it not been for his sister, who loved him dearly, and who would listen quite patiently to all the stories that he had to tell, who never laughed at him or told him, that he was telling lies as his brothers did. But one day a very sad thing happened. At least it was a sad thing for poor Asipaddle. For it chanced that the king of these parts had one only daughter, the princess Jem de Lovely, whom he loved dearly, and to whom he denied nothing. And princess Jem de Lovely was in want of a waiting maid, and as she had seen Asipaddle's sister, standing by the garden gate as she was riding by one day and had taken a fancy to her she asked her father if she might ask her to come and live at the castle and serve her her father agreed at once as he always did agree to any of her wishes and sent a messenger in haste to the farmer's house to ask if his daughter would come to the castle to be the princess's waiting maid and of course the farmer was very pleased at the piece of good fortune which had befallen the girl, and so was her mother, and so were her six brothers. 
all except poor Assapaddle, who looked with wistful eyes after his sister as she rode away, proud of her new clothes and of the rivlins which her father had made her out of cowhide, which she was to wear in the palace when she waited on the princess, for at home she always ran barefoot. Time passed, and one day a rider rode in hot haste through the country, bearing the most terrible tidings. For the evening before, some fishermen, out in their boats, had caught sight of the Mester Stirworm, which, as everyone knows, was the largest and the first and the greatest of all sea serpents. It was that beast which, in the good book, is called the Leviathan, and if it had been measured in our day, its tail would have touched Iceland, while its snout rested on the North Cape. And the fishermen had noticed that this fearsome monster had its head turned towards the mainland, and that it opened its mouth and yawned horribly, as if to show that it was hungry, and that if it were not fed it would kill every living thing upon the land, both man and beast, bird and creeping thing. For t'was well known that its breath was so poisonous that it consumed as with a burning fire everything that it lighted on, so that, if it pleased the awful creature to lift its head, and put forth its breath like noxious vapor over the country, in a few weeks the fair land would be turned into a region of desolation. As you may imagine, everyone was almost paralyzed with terror at this awful calamity which threatened them, and the king called a solemn meeting of all his counselors, and asked them if they could devise any way of warding off the danger. And for three whole days they sat in council, these grave-bearded men, and many were the suggestions which were made, and many the words of wisdom which were spoken. But alas, no one was wise enough to think of a way by which the Mester Storeworm might be driven back. At last, at the end of the third day, when everyone had given up hope of finding a remedy, the door of the council chamber opened, and the queen appeared. Now the queen was the king's second wife, and she was not a favorite in the kingdom, for she was a proud, insolent woman, who did not behave kindly to her stepdaughter, the Princess Gem de Lovely, and who spent much more of her time in the company of a great sorcerer, whom everyone feared and dreaded, than she did in that of the king, her husband. So the sober counselors looked at her disapprovingly as she came boldly into the council chamber, and stood up beside the king's chair of state and speaking in a loud, clear voice, addressed them thus, Ye think that ye are brave men and strong, O ye elders, and fit to be the protectors of the people, and so it may be, when it is mortals that ye are called on to face, that ye be no match for the foe that now threatens our land. Before him your weapons be but as straw. Tis not through strength of arm, but through sorcery that he will be overcome. So listen to my words, even though they be but those of a woman, and take counsel with a great sorcerer, from whom nothing is hid, but who knoweth all the mysteries of the earth, and of the air, and of the sea. Now the king and his counsellors liked not this advice, for they hated the sorcerer, who had, as they thought, too much influence with the queen. But they were at their wit's end, and knew not to whom to turn for help so they were fain to do as she said, and summon the wizard before them. And when he obeyed the summons, and appeared in their midst, they liked him none the better for his looks. For he was long and thin and awesome, with a beard that came down to his knee, and hair that wrapped him about like a mantle, and his face was the color of mortar, as if he had always lived in darkness, and had been afraid to look on the sun. But there was no help to be found in any other man, so they laid the case before him, and asked him what they should do. And he answered coldly that he would think over the matter, and come again to the assembly the following day, and give them his advice. And his advice, when they heard it, was like to turn their hair white with horror, for he said that the only way to satisfy the monster, and to make it spare the land, was to feed it every Saturday with seven young maidens who must be the fairest who could be found. And if, after this remedy had been tried once or twice, it did not succeed in mollifying the storeworm and inducing them to depart, there was but one other measure that he could suggest, 
but that was so horrible and dreadful that he would not rend their hearts by mentioning it in the meantime. And as, although they hated him, they feared him also, the council had Ian to abide by his words, and pronounced the awful doom. And so it came about that every Saturday seven bonny innocent maidens were bound hand and foot, and laid on a rock which ran into the sea. And the monster stretched out his long jagged tongue, and swept them into his mouth, while all the rest of the folk looked on from the top of a high hill, or at least the men looked, with cold set faces while the women hid theirs in their aprons, and wept aloud. Is there no other way, they cried, no other way than this to save the land? But the men only groaned and shook their heads. No other way, they answered, no other way. Then suddenly a boy's indignant voice rang out among the crowd. Is there no grown man who would fight that monster and kill him and save the lassies alive? I would do it. I am not feared for the Mester Storeworm. It was the boy Assapaddle who spoke, and everyone looked at him in amazement as he stood, staring at the great sea serpent, his fingers twitching with rage and his great blue eyes glowing with pity and indignation. The poor baron's mad. The sight hath turned his head, they whispered to one another, and they would have crowded round him to pet and comfort him, but his elder brother came and gave him a heavy clout on the side of his head. Thou fight the storeworm, he cried contemptuously. A likely story. Go home to the ash pit and stop speaking havers. And taking his arm, he drew him to the place where his other brothers were waiting, and they all went home together. But all the time Assapaddle kept on saying that he meant to kill the storeworm, and at last his brothers became so angry at what they thought was mere bragging that they picked up stones and pelted him so hard with them that at last he took to his heels and ran away from them. That evening the six brothers were threshing corn in the barn, and Assapaddle, as usual, was lying among the ashes thinking his own thoughts when his mother came out and bade him run and tell the others to come in for their supper. The boy did as he was bid, for he was a willing enough little fellow, but when he entered the barn, his brothers, in revenge for his having run away from them in the afternoon, set on him and pulled him down, and piled so much straw on top of him, that had his father not come from the house to see what they were all waiting for, he would, of a surety, have been smothered. But when at supper time his mother was quarreling with the other lads for what they had done, and saying to them that it was only cowards who set on barons littler and younger than themselves, Assapaddle looked up from the bicker of porridge which he was supping. Vex not thyself, mother, he said, for I could have fought them all off if I liked, ay, and beaten them too. Why didst thou not assay it then? cried everybody at once because I knew that I would need all my strength when I go to fight the giant storeworm, replied Assapaddle gravely, and as you may fancy the others laughed louder than before. Time passed, and every Saturday seven lassies were thrown to the storeworm, until at last it was felt that this state of things could not be allowed to go on any longer, for if it did, there would soon be no maidens at all left in the country. So the elders met once more, and after long consultation it was agreed that the sorcerer should be summoned, and asked what his other remedy was. For, by our troth, said they, it cannot be worse than that which we are practising now. But had they known it, the new remedy was even more dreadful than the old, for the cruel queen hated her stepdaughter, Jem de Lovely, and the wicked sorcerer knew that she did, and that she would not be sorry to get rid of her. And, things being as they were, he thought that he saw a way to please the queen. So he stood up in the council, and pretending to be very sorry, said that the only other thing that could be done was to give the princess Jem de Lovely to the storeworm. Then would it, of a surety, depart. When they heard this sentence, a terrible stillness fell upon the council, and everyone covered his face with his hands for no man dare look at the king. But although his dear daughter was as the apple of his eye, 
He was a just and righteous monarch, and he felt that it was not right that other fathers should have been forced to part with their daughters in order to try and save the country if his child was to be spared. So, after he had had speech with the princess, he stood up before the elders and declared, with trembling voice, that both he and she were ready to make the sacrifice. She is my only child, he said, and the last of her race, yet it seemeth good to both of us that she should lay down her life, if by doing so she may save the land that she loves so well. Salt tears ran down the faces of the great bearded men as they heard their king's words, for they all knew how dear the princess Jem de Lovely was to him, but it was felt that what he said was wise and true, and that the thing was just and right, for twere better surely that one maiden should die even although she were of royal blood, than that bands of other maidens should go to their death, week by week, and all to no purpose. So, amid heavy sobs, the aged lawman, he who was the chief man of the council, rose up to pronounce the princess's doom. But, ere he did so, the king's kemper, or fighting man, stepped forward. "'Nature teaches us that it is fitten that each beast hath a tail,' he said, and this doom which our lawman is about to pronounce is in very sooth a venomous beast. And if I had my way, the tale which it would bear after it is this, that if the mister storeworm doth not depart, and that right speedily after he have devoured the princess, the next thing that is offered to him be no tender young maiden, but that tough lean old sorcerer and at his words there was such a great shout of approval that the wicked sorcerer seemed to shrink within himself, and his pale face grew paler than it was before. Now three weeks were allowed between the time that the doom was pronounced upon the princess and the time that it was carried out, so that the king might send ambassadors to all the neighboring kingdoms to issue proclamation that if any champion would come forward who was able to drive away the storeworm and save the princess, he should have her for his wife. And with her he should have the kingdom, as well as a very famous sword that was now in the king's possession, but which had belonged to the great god Odin, with which he had fought and vanquished all his foes. The sword bore the name of Sicker Snapper, and no man had any power against it. The news of all these things spread over the length and breadth of the land, and every one mourned for the fate that was like to befall the princess Jem de Lovely. And the farmer and his wife and their six sons mourned also, all but Asapaddle, who sat amongst the ashes, and said nothing. So six and thirty champions arrived at the king's palace, each hoping to gain the prize. But the king sent them all out to look at the giant storeworm lying in the sea, with its enormous mouth open, and when they saw it twelve of them were seized with sudden illness, and twelve of them were so afraid that they took to their heels and ran, and never stopped till they reached their own countries, and so only twelve returned to the king's palace. And as for them, they were so downcast at the thought of the task that they had undertaken that they had no spirit left in them at all, and none of them dared try to kill the storeworm, so the three weeks passed slowly by until the night before the day on which the princess was to be sacrificed. On that night the king, feeling that he must do something to entertain his guests, made a great supper for them. But, as you may think, it was a dreary feast for everyone was thinking so much about the terrible thing that was to happen on the morrow that no one could eat or drink. And when it was all over and everybody had retired to rest, save the king and his old Kemperman, the king returned to the great hall and went slowly up to his chair of state, high up on the dais. It was not like the chairs of state that we know nowadays. It was nothing but a massive kist in which he kept all the things which he treasured most. The old monarch undid the iron bolts with trembling fingers and lifted the lid, and took out the wondrous sword Sicker Snapper, which had belonged to the great god Odin. His trusty Kemperman, who had stood by him in a hundred fights, watched him with pitying eyes. 
Why lift ye out the sword, he said softly, when thy fightin' days are done? Right nobly hast thou fought thy battles in the past, O oh my lord, when thine arm was strong and sure. But when folks' years number four score and sixteen, as thine do, tis time to leave such work to other and younger men. The old king turned on him angrily, with something of the old fire in his eyes. Whist, he cried, else will I turn this sword on thee. Dost thou think that I can see my only bairn devoured by a monster, and not lift a finger to try and save her when no other man will? I tell thee, and I will swear it with my two thumbs crossed on sicker snapper, that both the sword and I will be destroyed before so much as one of her hairs be touched. So go, and thou love me, my old comrade, and order my boat to be ready with the sail set and the prow pointed out to sea. I will go myself and fight the storeworm, and if I do not return, I will lay it on thee to guard my cherished daughter. Peradventure, my life may redeem hers. Now that night, everybody at the farm went to bed betimes, for next morning, the whole family was to set out early to go to the top of the hill near the sea to see the princess eaten by the storeworm, all except Assapaddle, who was to be left at home to herd the geese. The lad was so vexed at this, for he had great schemes in his head, that he could not sleep, and as he lay tossing and tumbling about in his corner among the ashes, he heard his father and mother talking in the great box bed, and as he listened he found that they were having an argument. "'Tis such a long way to the hill overlooking the sea. I fear me I shall never walk it,' said his mother. "'I think I had better bide at home.' "'Nay,' replied her husband, that would be a bonny-like thing when all the countryside is to be there. Thou shalt ride behind me on my good mare go swift. I do not care to trouble thee to take me behind thee, said his wife, for methinks thou dost not love me as thou wert wont to do. The woman's haverin, cried the good man of the house impatiently. What makes thee think that I have ceased to love thee? Because thou wilt no longer tell me thy secrets, answered his wife. To go no further, think of this very horse, go swift. For five long years I've been begging thee to tell me how it is that, when thou ridest her, she flies faster than the wind, while if any other man mount her, she herples along like a broken-down nag. The good man laughed. "'Twas not for a lack of love, good wife,' he said, though it might be lack of trust, for women's tongues wag but loosely, and I did not want other folk to ken my secret. But since my silence hath vexed thy heart, I will e'en tell it thee. When I want go swift to stand, I give her one clap on the left shoulder. When I would have her go like any other horse, I give her two claps on the right. But when I want her to fly like the wind, I whistle through the windpipe of a goose. And as I never can when I want her to gallop like that, I aye keep the bird's thrapple in the left-hand pocket of my coat. "'So that is how thou managest the beast,' said the farmer's wife, in a satisfied tone. "'And that is what becomes of all my goose thrapples. "'Oh, but thou art a clever fellow, good man, and now that I ken the way of it, I may go to sleep.' Assapaddle was not tumbling about in the ashes now. He was sitting up in the darkness with glowing cheeks and sparkling eyes. His opportunity had come at last, and he knew it. He waited patiently till their heavy breathing told him— that his parents were asleep. Then he crept over to where his father's clothes were, and took the goose's windpipe out of the pocket of his coat, and slipped noiselessly out of the house. Once he was out of it, he ran like lightning to the stable. He saddled and bridled Go Swift, and threw a halter round her neck, and led her to the stable door. The good mare, unaccustomed to her new groom, pranced and reared and plunged, but Assapaddle, knowing his father's secret, clapped her once on the left shoulder, and she stood as still as a stone. Then he mounted her and gave her two claps on the right shoulder, and the good horse trotted off briskly, giving a loud neigh as she did so. The unwanted sound ringing out in the stillness of the night roused the household, and the good man and his six sons came tumbling down the wooden stairs, shouting to one another in confusion that someone was stealing Go Swift. The farmer was the first to reach the door, and when he saw in the starlight the vanishing form of his favorite steed, he cried at the top of his voice, 
Stop, thief, ho, go swift, woe! And when Go Swift heard that, she pulled up in a moment. All seemed lost, for the farmer and his sons could run very fast indeed, and it seemed to Asapaddle, sitting motionless on Go Swift's back, that they would very soon make up on him. But luckily he remembered the goose's thrapple, and he pulled it out of his pocket and whistled through it. In an instant the good mare bounded forward, swift as the wind, and was over the hill and out of reach of its pursuers, before they had taken ten steps more. Day was dawning when the lad came within sight of the sea, and there in front of him in the water lay the enormous monster whom he had come so far to slay. Anyone would have said that he was mad even to dream of making such an attempt, for he was but a slim, unarmed youth, and the mester storeworm was so big that men said it would reach the fourth part round the world and its tongue was jagged at the end like a fork, and with this fork it could sweep whatever it chose into its mouth and devour it at its leisure. For all this, Asapaddle was not afraid, for he had the heart of a hero underneath his tattered garments. I must be cautious, he said to himself, and do by my wits what I cannot do by my strength. He climbed down from his seat on Go Swift's back and tethered the good steed to a tree and walked on looking well about him till he came to a little cottage on the edge of a wood. The door was not locked, so he entered and found its occupant, an old woman, fast asleep in her bed. He did not disturb her, but he took down an iron pot from the shelf and examined it closely. This will serve my purpose, he said, and surely the old dame would not grudge if she knew t'was to save the princess's life. Then he lifted a live peat from the smouldering fire and went his way. Down at the water's edge he found the king's boat lying, guarded by a single boatman, with its sail set and its prow turned in the direction of the mester storeworm. "'It's a cold morning,' said Asapaddle. "'Art thou not well nigh frozen sitting there? If thou wilt come on shore and run about and warm thyself, I will get into the boat and guard it till thou returnest.' "'A likely story,' replied the man. And what would the king say if he were to come, as I expect every moment he will do and find me playing myself on the sand, and his good boat left to a smatch it like thee? T'would be as much as my head is worth. As thou wilt, answered Asapaddle carelessly, beginning to search among the rocks. In the meantime I must be looking for a wean mussels to roast for my breakfast. And after he had gathered the mussels, he began to make a hole in the sand to put the live peat in. The boatman watched him curiously, for he too was beginning to feel hungry. Presently the lad gave a wild shriek and jumped high in the air. Gold, gold, he cried, by the name of Thor, who would have looked to find gold here? This was too much for the boatman. Forgetting all about his head and the king, he jumped out of the boat and pushing Asapaddle aside, began to scrape among the sand with all his might. While he was doing so, Asapaddle seized his pot, jumped into the boat, pushed her off, and was half a mile out to sea, before the outwitted man, who, needless to say, could find no gold, noticed what he was about. And of course he was very angry, and the old king was more angry still when he came down to the shore, attended by his nobles and carrying the great sword Sicker Snapper, in the vain hope that he, poor feeble old man that he was, might be able in some way to defeat the monster and save his daughter. But to make such an attempt was beyond his power now that his boat was gone, so he could only stand on the shore, along with the fast assembling crowd of his subjects, and watch what would befall. And this is what befell. Asapaddle, sailing slowly over the sea, and watching the mester storeworm intently, noticed that the terrible monster yawned occasionally, as if longing for his weekly feast. And as it yawned, a great flood of sea water went down its throat, and came out again at its huge gills. So the brave lad took down his sail and pointed the prow of his boat straight at the monster's mouth and the next time it yawned he and his boat were sucked right in, and like Jonah went straight down its throat into the dark regions inside its body. On and on the boat floated, 
but as it went the water grew less, pouring out of the storeworm's gills, till at last it stuck, as it were, on dry land, and Asapaddle jumped out, his pot in his hand, and began to explore. Presently he came to the huge creature's liver, and having heard that the liver of a fish is full of oil, he made a hole in it and put in the live peat. Woe's me, but there was a conflagration, and Asapaddle just got back to his boat in time, for the mester storeworm in its convulsions threw the boat right out of its mouth again, and it was flung up high and dry on the bare land. The commotion in the sea was so terrible that the king and his daughter, who by this time had come down to the shore, dressed like a bride in white, ready to be thrown to the monster, and all his courtiers, and all the country folk, were fain to take refuge on the hilltop, out of harm's way, and stand and see what happened next. And this is what happened next. The poor distressed creature, for it was now to be pitied, even though it was a great, cruel, awful mester storeworm, tossed itself to and fro, twisting and writhing. And as it tossed its awful head out of the water, its tongue fell out and struck the earth with such force that it made a great dent in it, into which the sea rushed, and that dent formed the crooked straits, which now divide Denmark from Norway and Sweden. Then some of its teeth fell out and rested in the sea, and became the islands that we now call the Orkney Isles, and a little afterwards some more teeth dropped out, and they became what we now call the Shetland Isles. After that the creature twisted itself into a great lump and died, and this lump became the island of Iceland, and the fire which Asapaddle had kindled with his live peat still burns on underneath it, and that is why there are mountains which throw out fire in that chilly land. When at last it was plainly seen that the mester storeworm was dead, the king could scarce contain himself with joy. He put his arms round Asapaddle's neck and kissed him and called him his son, and he took off his own royal mantle and put it on the lad and girded his good sword sicker snapper round his waist, and he called his daughter the Princess Jem de Lovely to him and put her hand in his and declared that when the right time came she should be his wife, and that he should be ruler over all the kingdom. Then the whole company mounted their horses again, and Asapaddle rode on go swift by the princess's side, and so they returned with great joy to the king's palace. But as they were nearing the gate, Asapaddle's sister, she who was the princess's maid, ran out to meet him, and signed to the princess to lout down, and whispered something in her ear. The princess's face grew dark, and she turned her horse's head, and rode back to where her father was with his nobles. She told him the words that the maiden had spoken, and when he heard them his face too grew as black as thunder, for the matter was this. The cruel queen, full of joy at the thought that she was to be rid once for all of her stepdaughter, had been making love to the wicked sorcerer all the morning in the old king's absence. "'He shall be killed at once,' cried the monarch. "'Such behavior cannot be overlooked.' "'Thou wilt have much ado to find him, your majesty,' said the girl. "'For tis more than an hour since he and the queen fled together on the fleetest horses that they could find in the stables.' "'But I can find him,' cried Asapaddle and he went off like the wind on his good horse, Go Swift. It was not long before he came within sight of the fugitives, and he drew his sword and shouted to them to stop. They heard the shout and turned round, and they both laughed aloud in derision when they saw that it was only the boy who groveled in the ashes who pursued them. "'The insolent brat! I will cut off his head for him! I will teach him a lesson!' cried the sorcerer and he rolled boldly back to meet Asapaddle. For although he was no fighter, he knew that no ordinary weapon could harm his enchanted body, therefore he was not afraid. But he did not count on Asapaddle having the sword of the great god Odin, with which he had slain all his enemies. And before this magic weapon he was powerless, and at one thrust the young lad ran it through his body as easily as if he had been any ordinary man, 
and he fell from his horse, dead. Then the courtiers of the king, who had also set off in pursuit, but whose steeds were less fleet of foot than go swift, came up and seized the bridle of the queen's horse, and led it and its rider back to the palace. She was brought before the council and judged, and condemned to be shut up in a high tower for the remainder of her life, which thing surely came to pass. As for Asopaddle, when the proper time came, he was married to the Princess Gem de Lovely, with great feasting and rejoicing, and when the old king died, they ruled the kingdom for many a long year. <laughs>